Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. My name is Eleonora Gilbert and today my guest is Tom Condon. Hi Tom. Hi. Uh, Tom is, um, has worked with the Enneagram since the 1980s and uh, with Ericksonian hypnosis and NLP neuro linguistic programming since 1977 and he uses these three tools uh, to bring about change and in a moment I will ask you how you do that. Um, you are the author of a couple of books as well as 50 CDs and DVDs. Um, you have taught over 800 workshops world worldwide, that's amazing, and you are the director of the Change Work and you're based in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And the two books that we're going to talk about, well, we're going to talk about one particular book, which is the dynamic of the Enneagram, the dynamic Enneagram, how to work with your personality style to truly grow and change. And it's only available at the moment as an ebook. And, uh, and as a serial, but it will be available in the summer. Uh, and it's just about two thirds available. Also, uh, you have written How to See Enneagram Styles in the Movies. That was your very first book. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Well, what we're going to be talking about today is, the, is, a, is, is relationship and how the Enneagram, including the other two tools that you're using, could be supportive of how to be more authentic in relationships. So before we start, can you just give me a little, can you give us a little synopsis of what the Enneagram is and the Ericksonian um, hypnosis and NLP and how you work with these three? Uh, well, the Enneagram is a system of nine personality styles, uh, kind of arranged in a circle and it, um, kind of gives you, uh, uh, it, it presents nine central personality styles that people have that the unconscious mind seems to favor in human beings. And then within that there are interconnections and subtler, finer distinctions that matter quite a bit, especially in relationships as we'll probably talk about. Uh, but it is basically a, a very deceptively deep system that shows you your central preoccupations and kind of beliefs and unconscious assumptions about the nature of reality, who you are within that uh, vision of reality, your sort of subjective worldview, its contours and its uh, uh, urgencies. And also it uh, talks a lot about what motivates people, how, how people are motivated differently from within different Enneagram styles. And then I've worked with the Enneagram for a long time, but I've also worked with NLP and Ericksonian hypnosis and uh, Gestalt therapy and imagery. And my principal interest when I first came across the Enneagram was in applying various methods to it to help people grow and change from within the purview of their Enneagram styles and the Enneagram especially will show you your talents and your resources and your capacities and potentials and then it will also show you, it's sort of good news and bad news, it will also show you the low side of your style and how you go wrong with confidence and ways that you get you know sort of stuck in repetitive patterns that seem to have some meaning to you or once had some adaptive purpose in the, in the past and now are, are just uh, behaviors or uh, assumptions or patterns that get in the way. Right. And block things like uh, having a more complete life but also block uh, intimacy for instance, uh, block, um, uh, you know, get in the way in relationships. Right. So um, these other kind of disciplines besides the Enneagram are all kind of technique oriented and all kind of method oriented. And then the Enneagram is a superb diagnostic system. And it seemed to me that they needed to be married. Right. So to speak. And I think you're unique in actually using these particular three tools. Uh, so far. In, in, well, yes. <laughs> At least within the little universe of the, right, okay. of the Enneagram, yeah. Well, in your book you talk uh, a lot about, or you mention for sure, uh, the, uh, the parental points as being influential in how we relate to one another. Well, you have, a, you have a central Enneagram style. Yes. And then you have connections to 
generally uh, four other Enneagram styles in the way that the system is formulated. Uh, the Enneagram is easy to learn but difficult to master and yes. it takes a while. But you can apprehend it pretty quickly and get the basic idea and even maybe get to your central Enneagram style pretty fast. And then as you, if, if it interests you and you have some motivation and uh, some ongoing curiosity about it, then you can add in these other subtler distinctions and they make a world of difference as well. And one of the distinctions that I, uh, that I like to emphasize and uh, encourage people to kind of identify is the Enneagram styles of their parents. Mm. Because once you identify your central style and some of these other connections, you also have the, uh, the Enneagram styles of your mother or your father or whomever was your basic caregiver through time. Um, th those are uh, those are operating too. Those are those are in your behavior and in your reaction sometimes, sort of like sides to your character. Yes, um, I had not come across this particular distinction before reading your book, and one of the things that I was definitely aware of is the fact that we apparently have. Oh, we can come from the perspective of having two superegos sitting on our shoulders in addition to our own superegos and the superegos of our parents. So to actually identify them even clearer as the types of your parents, I found that particularly useful. Well, it's something people know in real life, you know, when they mm -hmm. uh, grow up and have their own children and, you know, they start talking to their own children the way one of their parents talked to them and maybe they vowed they would never talk to their own children that way, but it pops out. Yeah. We, we introject our parents. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. We have them we inside do. of us. And so that means as well we introject their Enneagram styles. Yeah. And maybe those Enneagram styles overlap with our central style or maybe some of these other connections I was talking about which tends to then strengthen and intensify the, uh, the experience of that style. Or maybe there's, there's no connection, mm. you know, maybe at least in terms of the way the Enneagram formulates things. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, the other thing about it is, um, you know, within the Enneagram, within each Enneagram style, there's a tendency to over-identify with certain aspects of your personality and under-identify with others. And one is like an ego ideal, you know, like a one style, style number eight emphasizes being strong. Yes. And so their intention to their own weakness sometimes, their intention to their own vulnerability or uh, a kind of level of their experience where they're a little bit lost and, a little, and don't know what to do. And so they, they overcompensate. And uh, when you carry your parents with you, um, or when you, you know, figure out your, the Enneagram styles of one of your parents, how you relate to that in yourself may, may be shaded by how you relate to it in your parents, in the actual person. For example, my style would be counterphobic six, mm -hmm. and my father was an eight. Right. And we didn't get along when I was young. We fought a lot. Now, during that period of time, I denied that I was anything like him. And of course, looking back on it, the stronger I denied it, the more I was like him. And that's because it was a shadow for yes. me. And I was trying to create a boundary, and it's, you know, it's something young people go through anyway, and teenagers go through where you're trying to separate and kind of establish your own self-definition somehow. But at the same time, I had a, a, somewhere inside of myself an eight streak and gradually I realized this. Gradually it took me a while to m manage it and to learn how to kind of accept it and um, stop reacting out of the low side of it and start finding my way to the high side of it. But this also parallels how sometimes you can have uh, a conflict with a parent and then as you both get older and grow and change, you kind of get together, you know, you sort of Mm, forgive each other or yes. you become friends after all or something like that which is in fact what happened with my father. Yeah I was going to ask you if you'd actually had improved your relationship with him or whether that you also needed something for him to change in order to be able to meet. Um, 
I think Perhaps. for myself, I just accepted that it wasn't going to change. Right. And that was all right. Yes. There was a way to, to yeah. maneuver with that. But what was even more salient was dealing with my own eightness. Right. Yes. And that became an advantage. You know, the yes. high side of eight is, uh, has it's a lot helpful. of, yeah, it's got a lot of uh, resources and capacities, and it's especially helpful for a six. Yeah. It's got a kind of honesty and a kind of motive force and a decisiveness, things right. like that, that, uh, that sort of uh, cut against the uh, uh, neurotic tendencies of the six style. In your book, you also mention how families have an ego and an ego style to which you either meet or you go against. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, it's, it's sort of, um, it's hard to talk about without sounding overgeneralized. But, uh, and people will talk, for example, about uh, different countries having different Enneagram styles. And uh, you can say that certainly in, in a broad stroke sort of way. And also you, you, um, recognize it. You know, you could recognize uh, France as having um, Enneagram style number four sort of mm -hmm. running through it. But I, it's more precise to say that, the, that cultures have Enneagram styles influencing them and shading them. It's not always definitive which one it is. Right. But um, they're there. And also, if you go over to, say, a, a business context, a lot of businesses will have Enneagram styles running through the assumption of the business and the, the culture of the business. Usually it's the Enneagram style based on the founder or founders of the business. Right, right. And then if you apply that to a family, um, it's, it's sort of the same idea. You know, the family has a kind of culture, a little right. mini culture within it. And there can be assumptions within the family and kind of group beliefs about what is a good way to be and what's a bad way to function. And those will, upon reflection, those will turn out to have, you, you can kind of see an Enneagram style running through it. If you have, a, let's say, a family where, a family of high achievers, you right. know, a, a sort yes. of three-ish family, and there's no room for failure within it, then everybody's living in tension to that in some way or another, or living in reaction to it anyway. And maybe the... The family is unbalanced that way, mm -hmm. and so it needs a failure, you know. And so one, you know, one child comes along, one of the siblings is a screw up, yes. And everybody else is, you know, kind of in in polarity to that, you know. Th there can be that kind of thing, and then also there can be. Uh, it can be useful understanding your family through th through the enneagram. You can you can start to look at, and this applies to one to one relationships too, and friendships. Start to look at where you meet. Mm. Um, like I said, you know, everybody's got a central enneagram style, and then there are these kind of secondary connections that are like sides to your character. And sometimes you find in families that somewhere within the secondary connections, everybody's all meeting in one particular enneagram style. I see. You know, the, and uh, that sometimes is quite instructive and informative too. You know, you start to catch yourself in the act, you start to take everyone's behavior less personally, you start to um, kind of recognize, oh, there's a name for this, you know, this is a pattern, or, oh, look, the family is sinking into uh, depression again, you know, everybody's meeting in four, and it happens every year when the weather's bad, or something like that, you know. Yeah, that can be quite helpful, actually, to, uh, to, to be able to identify that. Yeah, it's quite helpful, it's yeah. quite helpful. Um, like I say, it's not, not something that you arrive at overnight. No, of course. Yeah. You have to be kind of interested in this and have some sort of motivation for it, some sort of need or see some use for it. Um, it's possible to encounter the Enneagram and, and underestimate it, mm -hmm. or it's possible to hear about it from somebody who's enthusiastic but is, doesn't know what they're talking about. Right. And think that it's a a bland, silly thing, or another set of stereotypes, or something. But actually, it's it's way deep. Mm, yeah, yeah. The more I uh, read about your book, the more I saw. Gosh, you know, there's so many aspects um, to be taken into account. Um, so, on the one hand, I felt, 
wow, there is so much is not just enough to know about your type, but you need to take into consideration all other types. And so the feeling was, oh my goodness, you know, this is, this is a lot. But at the same time, I also was, I really appreciated the fact of the various distinctions that you created, mm -hmm. because I was able then to see in my own life, in my own family, it's like, oh, I see that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. anyway, so the, both were there when, when, yeah, when, when I read Yeah, it just depends on what kind of use you have for it yeah. and motivation. Um, I often recommend if people are studying the Enneagram and really want to get into it over time, treat it like a hobby. Yeah. Treat it like something that you allow yourself to enjoy and that you come back to from time to time or something happens in real life and then you go kind of look it up in an Enneagram yeah. book and see how the, the two correspond. And yeah. to just sort of add in the, some of the distinctions that we're talking about over yes. time rather yes. than all trying in one to drink the no, entire no, ocean. No, no. That's right. I think I came across the Enneagram about 15 years ago. And uh, as I said, you know, it was very useful to, to, to see what kind of type, even though it took me quite a while to get, mm -hmm. several years to actually get into my actual type. And that's a process too. Sometimes. It is definitely it's a process. It's not overnight sometimes. Yeah. And yeah. For some people it's easier than for others. And for right. me it wasn't particularly easy. Right. You know, I went all over the place, uh, not quite all over the place, but certainly I went through two different, two other types right. in addition to my own. But um, the things that I found really, really, really an eye-opener were the subtypes. Can you tell us a little bit about the subtypes? People describe the subtypes differently. In fact, they also call it something else. So uh, in Enneagram, some Enneagram books, they'll call it instinctual subtypes yes. or the instincts. Yes. Um, I, I can only give you my version of it, and and mine is sort of shaded by the use that I put, uh, that I find with the material. Um, basically, what it's describing are uh, preoccupations, sort of sub preoccupations, that you can have within your central enneagram style, mm -hmm. and how these are then expressed, and how these are uh, how these influence and shade your expression of your style, for example. And what they mean by subtypes is that the, 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 they say there's three sort of categories of subtypes and people generally tend to favor one or two and, and under fa over favor maybe one in particular and under favor uh, a, a third, third one. one. Yeah. And they deal with three different, uh, the, uh, three different realms of life. One of them has to do with self-preservation. Yes. And it means that on some level a person, no matter what their Enneagram style, on some level they're especially preoccupied with uh, the, the material details of life. Making money, uh, food, survival, you know, having a house, uh, paying the bills, the, the details of life and that uh, preserve life and keep it going. And there's a, a high side and a low side to each of these in, in, in their broad aspects. The high side of self being a self-preservation subtype would be that you really take care of business. You really keep, uh, uh, keep things running in your life and, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, live a healthy life and mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe make money and uh, or are prosperous in whatever way you define that, and key, continually attend to and have a part of your consciousness sort of preoccupied with you, you know maintaining the, um, the the material side of life. What's what's true with all enneagram styles is that w um, there's a tendency when you get caught in the pattern of them to overuse your strength. To get um, to get into a sort of defensive mode, and then the the low side of an enneagram style comes out, and it's the same with subtypes too. On the low side of self-preservation, somebody could be so focused on self-preservation that it's to their detriment in some way. Yes. In other words, uh, making money and having a house and having food is all that you care about, and in doing that, then. It's like you're, you're sacrificing your life in order to have your life. You know, it's like there's no art, there's no love, there's no spirituality, there's no broader context, there's just kind of survival. 
I have a little example. You just reminded me of a friend of mine who has three freezers. Not uh -huh. just one, right. but three freezers. So, and, and clearly, she's a self-preservation. Right. So, you you anyway. can think of survivalism that yes. way, too, you know, on the, on the low side of it. Also, there can be a sort of paradoxical thing within this where somebody is so preoccupied with self-preservation that they maybe accumulate a lot of money and uh, a lot of material security and then go bankrupt, something like that, where they right. go in a kind of cycle. Um, so just an overemphasis. Yes. And then the next subtype that they make, uh, the, the, that the model describes is what they call intimate subtype. They sometimes call it sexual subtype. I'm not crazy about the word sexual because it's sort of misleading, but w w at least in my experience, what the intimate subtype describes are people who specialize in one-to-one -one relationships. Yes. And in one-to-one -one relationships, they have a capacity for sort of multi-level connections mm -hmm. with their close friends, for instance, or with a, a partner or a mate. And within that capacity, there is a, an ability to sort of, uh, you know, say, recognize the singularity of that other individual and be so closely connected to them sometimes that you're, you know, you could be out around the rings of Saturn floating in space and you wouldn't know it because you're just sort of uh, in involved intensely and connected yes. intensely. I'm smiling <laughs> because I recognize some you of recognize, what you're describing, yeah. yes. And um, so that, that's another sort of knack and also another sort of style of attention and also a motivation. Right. Somebody who is motivated to, for material security and self-preservation terms, they might not be motivated by the same thing that a, uh, an intimate subtype is motivated by. Yes. And on the low side of the intimate subtype, then it, it can mean that you put too much emphasis on relationships. You freight them up with expectations or dependency or, you know, what the other person does matters too much, you know, or the search for love, the quest for love can be a kind of, uh, all consuming. Well, or all never consuming ending. and never quite happening, also. Right. You know, like you want it so badly you prevent it from happening. Right. That kind of thing. And then with the, the, the third distinction they make within subtypes is uh, whether someone is uh, predominantly a social subtype. Mm -hmm. And what that means is instead of, you know, when you close your eyes, uh, when an intimate subtype closes their eyes, they might see one person or have one, a conversation with one person in their mind. When somebody with a social subtype orientation does that, there's a group. And they are uh, in tension to a group, conceiving of themselves in relation to a group, uh, preoccupied with social causes in some ways, yes. uh, kind of wanting a feeling on the high side like, your personal ben, uh, welfare is connected to group welfare. It's sort of like the Buddhist saying about, you know, no one can be enlightened until everyone is enlightened. Yes. And the identification with the group is quite strong and voluntary. It's like, I'm a social person, I'm a social entity, and I exist within this broader context, and the welfare of the broader context is important to me. If somebody is uh, more caught in the low side of that kind of orientation, then they're prone to have conflicts between uh, personal freedom and community, uh, individuation versus what the group wants, right. what my true standards are, who I really am in my heart of hearts versus how I am perceived in a group context um, according to some values and norms that are external to me. Right. And so you can get lost then. I mean, on the low side, you could join a cult or something like that, where you're just kind of caught up in a, a group context that takes you away from yourself, but is comforting in, on some level mm -hmm. and, or matches your expectations of who you are and what the, what the world expects of you. Also, you could, um, you could go back and forth about the group. Uh, you could, you know, sort of be a partial joiner and then partially pull back from it. You could uh, exist on the fringes of the group, on the edge of the group, and kind of enjoy the group energy. The group could see you a certain way, and then you could over-identify with how they see you. Right. Things like that. Doesn't yeah. sound very freedom or freeing 
creation well, it's of got, that. Well, you know, each one of these has a high side and a low side, yes, basically. Yes. Would you say uh, that these particular subtypes are actually learnt, or is it something that somehow we come into the world just like with our own type, there is a preference that somehow we come into the world and then nature and nurture do the work. So I was just wondering if the subtypes is also a learned thing or a... Personally, um, I don't think you're born with an Enneagram style. Okay. It's just my opinion. But I, I think that nature and nurture aren't, aren't really separate. They, sure. they need each other. And, <coughs> excuse me, the... You're born certainly with a temperament and a predisposition, and it probably uh, predisposes you to several Enneagram styles, but not all of them, something I like see. that. And then based on what happens to you, you maybe uh, at, at some point unconsciously form and adopt a style. Um, in terms of the subtypes, I find those a lot easier to track back into someone's experience of their personal biography. Right. Uh, quite a bit easier. And it's helpful for people to understand because part of what you're, what you're putting your finger on are what are defensive stances that I took early in life? Mm -hmm. What are um, preoccupations I developed based on the pressures around me or based on what kept happening to me that I unconsciously then thought, well, you know, I better keep paying attention to this. Yeah. It's especially important. Uh, this is... This is where my salvation is in some yeah. way. This is where my defensive safety is in some way. Or the strategies that I may have developed right. to yeah. make life more comfortable. Or to make life more comfortable or, or to just sort of, you know, maybe live in that family where there's all that pressure to succeed or where, um, you know, some other family where there were other pressures right. or uh, maybe you were singled out for a certain kind of treatment and whatever keeps happening to you, you yes. know, when you're young, is what you then start to do to yourself. Yes. So, right. in, uh, in this case, it would be sort of getting preoccupied, sometimes unconsciously, uh, preoccupied with uh, one of these three subtypes. And then, like I say, there's, there's really 27 of them. You know, yes. there's nine Enneagram styles and three subtypes for each one. And they come out really differently. Yes. in different styles and kind of shade the expression of the styles. Sort of like people in England from the south versus the north, that kind of right. thing. Right. So in hmm. relationships, is there a way that perhaps the stacking order might work better with your partner or with your family or in a, in a work situation? Well, one of the questions that comes up with the Enneagram is, you know, uh, I'm a four, what would be the best type for me to marry? And the answer is uh, a healthy type and one that loves you. And um, part of what that means is the Enneagram can really describe what the interactions will be if you're a four and somebody else is a seven or a, an eight. It can describe beautifully and with great insight and depth what it'll be like when it goes well and what it'll be like when it goes wrong. And it's pretty much the same with the subtypes. Right. It's more like you can, uh, you can really use it for insight into whatever's going on. Yes. But it, there's not really exactly a recommendation. No, I, I wasn't thinking about recommendations. I was all, more thinking in terms of, again, creating distinctions to recognize wh where is my subtype, perhaps in opposition to my partners, my husbands, my friends subtype so that instead of actually going against the other subtype I can actually have an understanding. Oh I see it's very very important to you to have such and such and such yes. if you are a self-preservation. If my self-preservation is at the bottom of the stack right. it would absolutely mean nothing but that's right. where the, you know, the conflict arises where for some person it's important for the other person it's absolutely meaningless. Well, what's interesting about the subtypes in the context of the Enneagram is a lot of times subtypes are more salient in close relationships and more meaningful and influential than differences in core Enneagram styles. Yes. It, it, can, really, it can really matter. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, if somebody is, for example, 
very preoccupied with self-preservation. Yes. And somebody else is very preoccupied with the intimate one-to-one -one connections. Yes. Um, if they don't find a bridge, then they'll be, then those two things will be the things they argue about over and over again. Right. <laughs> That'll be, you know, if you're if you've ever been in a long-term relationship, you notice there's a certain repetition to some of the things that yes. you wrangle about. Yes, yes. And, and the subtypes explains it beautifully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I certainly saw my, um, you know, sticky points when I was married, you mm -hmm. know, being a one-to-one, -one, being married to somebody who mostly self prays mm -hmm. You know, definitely there were areas where we just couldn't meet at all and, um, it was just yeah. painful, really. Yeah. And then when you realize, oh my goodness, is that all it was? You know, just simply the recognition that you have this particular kind of preference. And if I come that towards you, you know, there's no problem anymore. Well, there's, uh, yeah, you find you're operating out of different values, even though yes. you don't think you are. Yes. And sometimes there's ways to bridge that. Yeah. You know, or sometimes there's ways to bring that out in in yourself or in the other person or you know find some it, it depends on what else is in the relationship and yes. how much you want to stay together and things like yes. that the other thing to note about subtypes is that they're um, uh, sometimes contextual sometimes you go through phases in your life where you are occupying one subtype or reacting out of one subtype much more strongly than you might in general or in a, a long-term sort of way or maybe that you already have been reacting and most people's experience of the subtypes are that they're sort of characterological mm -hmm. but um, somebody could be self very self-preservationally oriented and then fall in love and until the chemicals wear off uh, they'll be they'll be sort of reacting much more out of their intimate subtype, right? You know, or somebody else could go into a social context of some kind, right. join the army or something. Yes. Suddenly they're in a group of people, whereas they'd been a you know a shy computer hacker before. Well, they're going to the the subtype, the the social instinct part of it, the social reaction is going to come out, and be expressed in a way that uh, the enneagram accounts for rather nicely, mm -hmm. I find. So would you say that once we become more aware, we somehow shift or change in our subtypes as well, or create perhaps more of a balance or? Well, people will look for that sometimes. Yeah. It, it, a lot of it depends on the individual and what they're going through and what they need and what they want, you know, mm -hmm. what they're motivated mm -hmm. to have for themselves. It is one way to look at it sometimes is, you know, I'm really strong in the intimate subtype and I'm kind of weak in self-preservation. Maybe I ought to educate myself, you know. Um, generally speaking, working with something like the Enneagram or if you broaden it to living a life of uh, where you grow and change and evolve, uh, there's getting over illusions, you know, and sort of going past limitations and going past uh, blocks and stuck points. And then on the other hand, there's also taking responsibility for gaps in your education. Mm -hmm. And so learning about um, whatever you're missing sometimes becomes a, a, a helpful thing, even if it's quite conscious and deliberate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see, I've made a few notes here. Okay. What else would I want to do about Yes, cultural influences. I'm beginning to see more and more and more and more how much these play into our lives. Um, so I was just wondering if you wanted to say something about it. Well, I, you know, like I said before, there's, there are Enneagram, Enneagrammatic uh, strains and influences running through different cultures, I would say. Um, it's not something I, I tried to define too tightly because mm -hmm. it's, you get into a kind of you get into cliché and stereotype country pretty fast. Yes, yes. Um, I do actually make an analogy to, between Enneagram styles and nationalities. Yeah, I liked that because I thought it was very graphic and very descriptive. Sort of um, like saying an Enneagram style is like your psychological nationality. And when you encounter people or know people with other Enneagram styles, it's, it's not unlike the difference in nationalities because yeah. An Enneagram style is deeply unconscious, 
Uh, it influences and shades a lot of your perceptions. And at the same time, it's ultimately not the only thing you are. Yes. You know, it's, a, it's ultimately not who you are, you know, in, some, in your heart of hearts somehow. And yet, you know, it could be very meaningful. And it's not something also that you grow out of or evolve out of, you know. What, what, it, what it is is something that you can wear more and more lightly if you're, yes. say, an expatriate, for yes. instance. Yes, yes. And I think that's a parallel with the Enneagram as well. Right. As people grow and change, the, the low side of their style and the, the kind of rigidity and repetitiveness of the pattern it's it's defensive, and if you work on it, you sort of drain the defenses of their intensity. Yes. And and then you you, you still have an inclination to thir think a certain way and not others, or, uh, uh, not another way, but you you wear it much more lightly, and the more lightly you wear it, the more open you are to the world around you, and also the more available the the talents and the high sides, uh, capacities and, and typical kind of resources uh, that go with your style, those are available to you much more. And what comes to mind also is a more openness of the heart. Because uh -huh. it's like, you know, we've been talking a lot about and describing a model and we haven't really spoken about the heart, you know, the falling in love, the, uh, the um, love and appreciation that we have for our friends and, and co-workers. Right. Um, and I, I imagine, or certainly in terms of my own experience, you know, the more I wear my type lightly, the more open I become mm -hmm. as, you know, the defenses that my particular type, my particular style provides right. somehow are. Well, and you also have fewer shadows too. Right. Which is to say fewer, there's fewer instances where you react negatively to somebody else in an automatic button pushing sort of way. Yes. It's like, ah, oh, that person pushes my buttons, you know. Yes. Um, one of the things, I go to Enneagram conferences. Yes. And, uh, I've been to a number of them in America, and one of the things you'll sometimes hear just sort of walking through a crowd is somebody talking about the styles that they like and dislike. Mm -hmm. And say, you know, I don't, you know, uh, everybody loves sevens, you know, but I don't like twos, you know, they're, mm. I always want to keep them at arm's length and they're coming up to my elbow, this kind of thing. And the person is talking about different Enneagram styles in a, a way I, I actually kind of term educated bigotry. Yes. Uh, because there's a, a sort of, you're, 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 you're taking the whole, you're taking a part and judging it and mistaking it for the whole. Yes. But also, uh, when a person talks that way, what they're, what they're really saying is, um, I have uh, those styles in myself, somehow, mm -hmm. latently, perhaps. And I like my own sevenness, and I don't like my own two-ness. And I haven't made you know, peace with it, and I haven't integrated it. And so they're talking about their own shadows, both, both white shadows and dark shadows. Yes. You know? Yeah. And that's a danger. That's certainly I found when I first learned about the Enneagram, that there was a tendency to pigeonhole people instead of actually creating more freedom and more liberation around one's own personality and that of others and have perhaps more compassion and more acceptance. You know, it was putting, really, narrowing people down and narrowing um, and labeling so yeah, quickly and, yeah. and dismissing so quickly, which I, and, and then somehow I just felt, no, I don't Well, if you label it like and that. dismiss it, then, um, there, there's a cartoon I saw years ago which showed a, a man in hell and he was shoveling coal into a wheelbarrow and the flames of hell were in the background and he was whistling, whistling a happy tune while he was shoveling coal for, to fuel the fires of hell. And a couple of devils are standing there with their pitchforks and one says to the other, you know, we're just not reaching this guy. <laughs> And if you use the Enneagram to sort of miss, uh, to, to label um, and then to dismiss yes. or to decide who you like and who you dislike, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's just not it's reaching It's not what he's designed to, to, no, to, to it's do, not, really. Uh, no. And furthermore, that can be tied to, you know, uh, a desire for control, a desire for... Uh, a way of uh, kind of pushing away the implications of what yeah. it might be telling you. Because yes. it's, it's, this is not for sissies. Mm. Um, the, the, 
the good news and bad news part of yes. it. You know, when you when you identify your central style, sometimes it it can be a shock, yeah. and it can be um, a little. There's there's a gruesome aspect to it yeah. as well as um, as well as the good news. Yeah. When it comes to conflict, I'm thinking in terms of one-to-one -one relationships or families, how can the Enneagram or knowing the Enneagram help in, uh, in conflict resolution? Well, you know, it saved a lot of marriages, mm -hmm. I, I figure, the Enneagram has. And w where, where it really does that is in situations where people are basically bonded and basically have, you know, a strong affectionate feeling for one another, but then there's aspects of each other's behaviors that drive them crazy. And uh, a lot of times learning about the other person's Enneagram style and realizing that that person's crazy-making behavior is A, not personal to you, and B, somehow attached to their view of the world and a, and a kind of trance that they're in and what they then believe is necessary to do in order to manage and cope with and, and live in that view of the world, it helps a lot. Right. It really helps a lot. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a broad answer to that question, which is it makes you more compassionate, or mm -hmm. it can if you'll allow it to. You might have Enneagram styles that you don't relate to at all, that you don't have any connection to, and that just baffle you. You know, you're, uh, you're from France, but you, you're damned if you understand people from Malaysia, you know, <laughs> that, that kind of thing. Yes. Um, but gradually, as you work with it for a while, it, it helps quite a bit. Right. It helps just to at least remind you that there are vastly different worldviews and that other people are not just doing what they're doing to get to you. Right. You know, that, that's a good point. Um, and then it, it, it gets harder to answer that question in, until you consider the individuals involved. Yes. You know, and what their individual styles are, and also subtypes, you know, will influence as well, you know. Um, but generally speaking, it, it works pretty well for uh, building bridges. Mm -hmm. And then also, th there are some things to measure, like, you know, in, in a marriage, for example, what is your rate of change versus the other person's rate of change? Yes. Things like that. You know, how well do you assimilate new information and get over uh, get over old limitations and how motivated are you to do it and then within the conflict the con construct of uh, context of a relationship there is a a way in which you know you sort of rub up against each other a lot uh, perhaps literally but also figuratively and as you, if you're, if you're both attempting to stay connected and go towards one another, you, you, you tend to eliminate little things that are in the way. Right. You know, and, and the Enneagram really helps with that, you know, sort of catching yourself in the act and beginning to, be, uh, seeing how you're maybe putting some barrier in the, uh, in the way, in the present, that used to be a necessary and effective thing, and now it's just something that gets in the way that protects you from things that happened in the past. And as you as you kind of do that, there, there's also the, the the fact that in in the studies of like long-term relationships where the two partners pronounce themselves uh, satisfied. A lot of times they're more preoccupied. A lot of times they'll say they focus more on what they can give than what they can receive. Right. Okay. They're they're, they're not doing so much bookkeeping about you know okay what she give me versus what I gave her, but there's more of a kind of generosity and a, a, a kind of emphasis on on giving, and then you get a lot more back. Yeah. You know, and also they they tend in those. Um, in those studies, the, the people tend to say also that they see the other person in a positive light, almost no matter what. But they're, re, they're realistically aware of the other person's limitations. Right. It's sort of like the truth plus 10% or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could I ask you, in your relationship, I don't know if you've been married just the once or, uh, or more than once, 
if um, you know how the, the the anagram or your understanding of the anagram has made you perhaps a better husband or a better father or uh, maybe none of the above. Uh, I've I've wanted to be a good husband. Yes. And uh, I don't know. You know, I would say that it's it's all of the things I just said. You know, right. that that uh, being able to change places with the other person and. And one of the things that it helps you do is anticipate what what a person's response will be. Um, and in doing that, in anticipating, it's it's far easier to not only deal with the response but also um, not take it personally. Mm. You know, you, you you sort of know where they're coming from. And I think this non-taking personally, it's quite a, quite a thing. To it's, bear in mind. Yeah, it's lovely. Yes. It's, that part of it is really nice. And then, you know, uh, the more you learn about your own th own style and your own patterns as well, you take those less personally too. Yes. Sort of like, okay, well, we're caught up in a kind of shadow play this afternoon, you know, and we'll work it out. Yeah. Hmm. I want to ask you something about, um, you know, I've interviewed a couple of other people from about relationship, but coming from the spiritual side of relationship. So in other words, you know, they're not two personalities that are interacting here, but there is something that is beyond the personality. And yes, you know, we're not taking the personality as being one thing and spirituality as being two separate things. They're all one, uh, being expressed by each, in, each person. But so, you know, we've been talking about the Enneagram coming from the perspective of the personality. Do you see, do, in your work, do you also include what's not the personality? What's more? I don't define it very tightly. Okay. Um, I, and I'm not real comfortable with a lot of spiritual language because it's... Um, Tell me why not. <laughs> because I have training in hypnosis. And Say more about that. Well, what does that mean? What it means is that you are trained in hypnosis to talk to people in a way that sounds specific but is actually really general. And you're trained to um, use a certain kind of language that is abstract and sort of noun-based. Uh, it's what, they, what writers call the passive voice, or what editors call the passive voice, that they're trying to cure writers of all the time. You'd, hypnotists do this on purpose. So they speak in an abstract way that is nevertheless structured. Mm -hmm. And they'll speak to, uh, I can speak to a large crowd of people and speak in this sort of process-oriented sort of way mm -hmm. using this language and everyone in the room thinks I'm speaking to them. Right. And that's the method. Unfortunately, um, what also happens is you you actually don't know the meaning of certain words after a while <laughs> because they're, they're sort of open-ended and you're very aware of um, people making their own meanings. And there's a lot of spiritual literature that is written exactly this way. It's when I look at it, I see not only the language of trance, but also the, the sequences and some of the methods and so on. I think what I'm like is... Um, uh, somebody who's been trained as a magician uh, to do magic tricks, who then sees somebody doing something and uh, who claims it's paranormal, and but I can see the trickery in it. I see. I think it's like that. But anyway, that's one reason I don't talk that way because I don't know what the words mean exactly. Right. So I and also I I don't tend to chunk in big abstract uh, terms. Uh, um, most of the work that I've done and most of what I pay attention to and kind of emphasize and value, I guess, is experiential. Hmm. So I'm more after, after the experience of it without nailing it down too tightly and without um, describing it in a way that for me is only abstract, I guess. Right, right. So if you were to... Um advise people 
you know, you said earlier, you know, find somebody that loves you, that uh, is, I can't even remember, but loves you, and what else did you say? Uh, Perhaps uh, more whole. Uh, marry a healthy type healthy and one that type. loves you. Right, okay. Yeah. So, well, that may be possible, may not be possible, but anyway, so in, given where society is today, given where marriages are today, uh, where we have far more divorces than we did 50 years ago, um, you know, how could we, what, what words of advice could you give us? Uh, don't listen to me. That would be one. <laughs> that would be first. And uh, I don't know. I mean, everybody's, we're talking about types. Yes. But everybody's an individual. Exactly, within yes. And so it's, it's really hard to generalize. Um, it depends on what you want and depends on what you're ready for. It depends on your, the sort of phase you're at in your life mm -hmm. and what would, what would mean the most to you. Mm. But if you meet somebody that you have a, a strong connection with and you want to stay together with them, a lot of these things that we've talked about can be useful considerations, useful, really useful things to learn about and to, and to apply and just sort of uh, uh, absorb into your, your knowledge base, but also um, you know, uh, use to modify your reactions, for example. And the other thing that is really, I think, sort of salient in relationships is how much you work on yourself. Hmm. Because, you, can, you know, you can get into, you can get locked into wanting the other person to change. Yeah. Or just uh, being, uh, reacting to them out of your own torment. I mean, you know, I've certainly done that. And at the same time, what what's really neat is is somehow uh, um, more self to self rather than self to other, like you've got to kind of come to terms with your own shadows in some way, or uh, put some fears that you have at rest, or uh, be willing to you know kind of go beyond certain limitations, you know, be willing to be ten percent braver some of the time. Uh, whatever you define what an experience as a risk for you. Yes. And then th there'll oftentimes be a dynamic in relationships where, you know, uh, a couple will take uh, two different polarized positions and then when one couple changes, the, the, the roles reverse. And uh, somebody who's, you know, critical, for instance, and, you know, sort of uh, following the other person around, you know, kind of criticizing their behavior. Maybe they work on that and they mellow out. And then the other person starts to become critical because now they've got a chance. Now there's room for that, you know, right. in the vacuum that the other change had, l yes. had left. So there's, there's dynamics like that, but generally speaking, I think, you know, in relationships, you're working on relating to and and reaching out to one another, but you're also um, dealing to some degree with your own shadows yes. and your own barriers to being able to reach out to one another. Yeah. And that's good work. That's, that's part of, in an odd way, that's part of being together. Yes. So we owe it to ourselves and to the other to actually... Well, I don't know about owing it, well, but it depends on what you want, you yeah. know. But um, if you want to... If having a, a deepening and more interesting connection to somebody yes. is part of your definition of a good life, yeah. then it's worth it. Yeah. yeah. People change sort of when, when it costs more to stay the same than it costs to change. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Like a cost-benefit analysis, to use a, a gross materialistic metaphor. Tom, it's been lovely speaking with you and exploring this. And um, I'm just going to show your dynamic Enneagram, which will be available in the summer. We are in winter 2013, so summer 2014. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you for joining me. And thank you very much for watching Conscience TV. And we'll see you again very soon. Thank you and goodbye.